The combined wealth of Australia's richest 250 individuals and families is said to be $532 billion. Think about that. That's according to the 2023 Rich List, compiled, compiled by John Stenschult, the Australian's list editor. Now, the list was released this week, and I caught up with John a little earlier this week. John, tell me about the state of the financial health of Australia's wealthiest as we sit here right now. It's been a roller coaster ride this year, Ross. I mean, mostly, mostly up, I think. I mean, there's been a lot of downs. Like, you look at the, the big technology names, for example, there's four of them that are down $25 billion combined. And I think that provides a big snapshot of what's going on. With so which four are they? So they're the two Atlassian co-founders. So Scott Farquhar, Mike Cannon-Brooks, yep. and Melanie Perkins and Cliff Obrecht from Canva, which is a privately held company. But obviously, you know, its valuation has been marked down by its investors. Well, Atlassian's investors have marked it down in the stock market. So they're down $25 billion combined. But I guess they've been replaced by some of the older-fashioned industries that are, that are roaring back. They actually make real money, Ross. You know, I'm talking about manufacturing and property and mining. Those moguls are doing pretty well still. OK, let's back up to the tech investors. And you're right about the Canva one. That's not listed, so there's no accurate market valuation. It's literally what price did the last person put money into that business at? But in the case of Atlassian, mm -hmm. you know, there's been significant job cuts, as there has been across that whole tech sector. They've actually had to cut their cloth according to the money coming through the door. So they're almost becoming like established businesses now. Yeah, exactly right. And that's why on the NASDAQ, they're on the NASDAQ, they're being marked down and being compared to, yeah, if you want to put in inverted commas, normal companies. So they're being judged on their profits rather than their roaring revenue increases of previous years. So, yeah, there's a, definitely a shift back to, uh, well, back to normality, I suppose. You know, back to, hey, what are you doing EBITDA-wise? What are you doing profit-wise? What are you doing to rein your costs in wise? All that sort of thing. So they, like a lot of other tech companies, are having to deal with those real life issues. So a lot of investors call this de-risking and that's what's taken place because the ability for new venture capital just to be poured in endlessly and simply on the promise that in the future somebody else will buy you out at a higher price, that seems to have gone now. You've got to, if you're a tech investor, an entrepreneur, prove that there is a business case to make money down the track. Yeah, exactly right. And you'll see that's being rewarded by the... Like, say, take Richard White, for example, from Wise Tech Global. He's up this year on the billionaire's list. So he's making money. There's actually four people on the list from Wise Tech alone from their share price. Yes. Because it's on the ASX, it's making money, its share price is going up, it's making acquisitions, it's in a good spot. So that, I think, probably marks it out from other tech companies. But, to I mean... Otherwise, you know, that's probably the, the one that's doing really, really well, where the others are, as you say, cutting jobs and, you know, cutting their cloth accordingly. So in terms of growth of wealth, would Richard White be probably the fastest growing on your list right now? Yeah, I think in percentage terms, he's done really, really well. He'd be one of the, the fastest ones for sure. So, look, some property people have done really well. Some manufacturers are going well as well. Which manufacturers? Explain one. Well, let's take Anthony Pratt, for example. He keeps... He keeps, uh, he keeps and making boxes and cardboard boxes over America where he says growth is forever. But there's a couple of other really interesting ones that are doing very well too, what I call smart manufacturers. Peter Friedman rode microphones. It makes it from silver water in... Which West is an incredible city. story. This exports to the world. Yeah. Uh, the Diamond family that are behind Penrite Oil. It's a company that's been around almost 100 years, but all of a sudden we get access to their accounts. They're making really, really good profits from South Dandenong in Melbourne, Victoria. I think those are great stories. Like, they are just good, solid companies that make good money every year. They pay their stuff well, they look after people, they keep exporting. And look, this, the proof is in the pudding, I think, on this rich list. OK, is the secret to wealth that long-term established family wealth or is it still a situation where you can go to the stock market, take a business, grow it rapidly, as Richard White from WiseTech has done, um, but others, as you say, the family behind Penrite, have actually been there for a long, long time, grafting away, doing their business? Yeah, I think it's... I mean, clearly the tech titans, you know, they're in their early 40s or in their 30s when it comes to Melanie Perkins. They've made their money quicker than anyone else. But, yeah, you're right, it's, it's almost like back to the, the days of, you know, building, literally, probably with the bricks and mortar people, building their wealth you know, pretty, pretty slowly and steadily compared to what might have been the case a few years ago. You take someone like Harry Triggerbuff, who we know quite well, you know, he's 90 years old and he's, he's worth, you know, $23 billion. And that, in percentage terms, he's gone up pretty well uh, in the last year because the property market for him, you know, the rental market is still very, very strong. So, yeah, the fundamentally strong businesses have grown pretty well in the last year. OK, notice that you brought together um, Harry Triggerboff with Tim Gurner. 
Now, Tim Gurner, Gurner Constructions has been out there in Melbourne in particular applying his trade, but many people see parallels between his journey and Harry's. What was it like when you brought them together? Yeah, Tim is a really big admirer of Harry's. And in fact, um, you know, Harry has all these really interesting idiosyncrasies. He puts together his prints out the sheets of paper every week and goes home and studies all the numbers in Meriton on a Saturday. And Tim said, oh, well, maybe I should be doing this too, you know, which is... It's funny for a 40-year-old for a guy who's, you know, really, really connected with marketing and technology to want to still be uh, looking at some of these old-fashioned traits in a way. So, yeah, it's a, it was a fascinating uh, discussion. There was a great moment where uh, Triggerboff, who's just turned 90 the other week, mm -hmm. he said, he pointed to Gunnar and said, you're the future, but I'm the present. <laughs> Which is fascinating to see that as well. Were there any surprises that suddenly pop up on the list as there are? Anything you discovered which are, is effectively the new money, the new ideas and concepts coming through. There's a couple of sisters from Sydney that I thought were really interesting. Nikki and Simone Zimmerman, the Zimmerman yeah. uh, fashion label. We've got them on the list at $600 million combined. I mean, they're making really, really good profits from selling dresses and fashion overseas. I mean... You know, this is, this is uh, you know, it's like some of our other fashion people. They start by selling at the local market. They get a store and they keep building and building. And all of a sudden, they've got boutiques in Paris and Florence and all these amazing places around the world, all from suburban Sydney. It's a really great story. Companies like Moose Toys, companies like Rode, companies like Black Magic Design, you know, they're, they're, they're Australian manufacturing companies that literally sell everywhere around the world. And Australia is probably just a small part of what they do. So yeah, you're right. I think uh, they might be old-fashioned industries in a way, but I think the, the strategy and their strategy and their focus is just so cutting-edge and modern, and that's what's made them successful. Well, John, it's always good to get this when the list of 250 wealthiest people in Australia and your assessment of them comes out, and we appreciate your time today. Thanks, Ross.